Hummingbird. Um, I gave you a list here of everything I used in my painting. You can um, freeze it and write it down if you like. And right here I have the image of the hummingbird that I used. I got it from unsplash.com and I drew my own version of this hummingbird and I traced it um, with a graphite paper behind uh, my drawing onto my 140 pound hot pressed arches paper. So we're going to start out here by painting all those lovely colors you see on the hummingbird. And I don't know about you, but I get hummingbirds in my yard. I live in Connecticut in the USA. And um, they usually come about in the end of May. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, maybe the beginning of May. And But I noticed them really early spring, maybe two weeks earlier than I anticipated. So I had to hurry up and clean out all of my hummingbird feeders. And um, I made them a nice um, nectar. And you can make the nectar by um, just adding one cup of sugar and four cups of water and just boiling it on the stove. And when everything is melted, just let it cool. And that becomes a beautiful nectar for these beautiful hummingbirds. Um, I like to keep it out till the fall till I know they're gonna migrate, migrate back down to the south. So um, we're starting this painting here with the yellows. And I always start my paintings with the lightest colors, which is gonna be the yellows, and, um, and then move on to the darker colors. So, but I'm just going to paint in all of the orange areas of the hummingbird and all of those uh, fluorescent green colors. And um, I started off with a pretty tea-like consistency of my paint and I'm just gonna smear it with some water here and there, just to feather it into the areas that are a little darker on the hummingbird. And um, all of this is gonna be covered up with the feather strokes in the end so you could just be really creative maybe uh, your hummingbird is purple you know uh, just you know just observe what you see in your image and um, like here you could see his green on his tail and a little bit of yellow green there and possibly a little bit of purple and um, okay so we're just going to keep going here what I did here you could see a brown mixture I'm using my red and that quinacridone red that I have and a little bit of the green. When you add complements together, you can make a really great neutral color. And I like to use the colors that I'm using in my painting to create my neutral colors because it's just a better, like harmonious look to the painting. So I know I had a purple in my description, but I don't think I even used it. Um, I'm using, uh, my paints are Windsor Newton and uh, Daniel Smith on this uh, tutorial. So um, those are really great quality paints and but you can use whatever paints you can afford and use whatever paints are similar to the ones I'm using. You don't have to use these exact colors. So I'm just gonna keep adding in the colors I see that are under like the feather strokes we're gonna put in on the end. So um, I'm just adding darks where I need it to be dark and light washes where I think it needs to be light and um, and just use your judgment just really observe your paint your photograph and paint what you see but don't um, don't guess just like really look and observe those colors I'm making these this purple area or this uh, neutral color here kind of together there's like one shape so squint your eyes and make shapes out of colors that you see and values that you see so when I'm painting in watercolor I like to use my brush and I tend to use the number six brush in a lot of my paintings it's just a very versatile um, brush and if you can get one that makes a really great point and um, it I tend to use it a lot because you can make literally tiny little strokes of um, you know just lines and then you could also make strokes that are a little wider and you can make washes with it too so try to try to afford a really good um, watercolor brush that um, you literally can use it for years 
and it'll be your favorite thing. So um, I like to, when I'm doing my watercolor paintings, when I'm, especially when you're doing an animal, you want to make your little marks going in the way that the the feathers are growing or the fur is growing. So I'm going to make these little tick marks. Here I'm showing you my cerulean blue color. Um, so I might have added that to another color here. Probably the green or the yellow to create a beautiful, more, um, you know, that vibrant green that you see on, on the um, bird. So I'm just observing my photo and I'm adding little strokes wherever I see that green and adding a little bit of water to wash it down or just give myself an idea of where all of those tiny little feathers are on his body. And um, just keep observing your photo and trying to like add a wash where you think it's just, you know, a color or Give yourself an idea of where those feather strokes are to help you when you add your little calligraphy marks at the end um, to define each feather. Yeah, so all of my marks kind of look like the base of the feathers. And I like all those little tiny white spaces in between too. It really makes it look like a beautiful watercolor in the end instead of using like a smooth wash. Um, but that's my style. If your style is different, experiment and have fun. We're meant to be having fun here. And um, I don't know about you, but when I'm painting, um, I can spend, now this painting was about an hour long for me and um, I made it a little shorter here I sped up the video but I have no concept of time when I'm painting it's just if you could find something to do where you have no concept of time and you're just enjoying yourself it's a great way to distress it's the way I distress so I love painting and I'm so happy to share with you how I paint and I'm so happy that you're here on my channel watching so thank you very much and if you like what you see please subscribe and hit that notification button and tell your friends because it really helps me along to um, create more videos for you so I'm going to keep going um, adding more little strokes of color and shading in all of the areas, the little feather areas on his body and making all kinds of little decisions based on what I'm observing on my photo.
So the other way I tend to work is once I've established sort of my lights and middle tones in um, an underpainting of my watercolors, I like to put in some dark because sometimes it's hard to figure out what your next step is if you don't have that balance of light and dark. So I don't really know how dark I should make maybe a feather if um, if I make it too dark, then it's not gonna look good. So I go for my darkest darks on the painting and start putting them in. So observe on your photo or whatever your reference is where the darkest darks are and start placing some in because it gives you an idea of all the rest of the values on your painting. So I'm adding the tail feathers in. I'm just gonna make a mass of, you know, my Payne's gray and maybe a little bit of that lunar blue in there. I'm carefully figuring out where each tail feather belongs. And then I'm just gonna go for it and add a lot of little lines with this amazing brush where I can make fine lines or washes with um, my number six, um, my number six watercolor brush and it's an Escada, I believe and I got it actually for free when I bought it um, a pad one day and I was like wow this is an amazing brush so it came with the pad so I didn't actually buy this brush but I will definitely buy another one and it, you can see in the beginning of the video I have a photo of it there So sometimes feathers can seem really daunting. I, it's like, oh, how do I do feathers? They seem kind of complicated, but they're not. Squint your eye and just draw masses of color. Um, I'm putting in the masses on the back side of his back because it is probably kind of one shape. And then I'm gonna start like breaking it apart and making little um, U shapes, but I'm making them kind of squiggly because the, I wanna get that feather look. Um, everything is just a shape so if you just really look at it and decide what that shape is you can pretty much paint anything so it's all about shape color and value nothing more it's very abstract so even a very detailed photorealistic painting that person zoomed in and did every every tiny square of the painting copied it exactly. So if, you, if I were to take this painting and I made a grid over it, let's say, let's make a grid over this, this photo and make every, like make, make maybe 50 squares over it and then do the same thing on top of your drawing pad. Then what you would do is look in every square and copy exactly what you see in that tiny little square square by square. That's what paint by numbers actually is. If you get a paint by number kit, it literally is the same thing. So if you were to make a grid over your photo and make made a grid over your drawing and or your painting 
and copied exactly grid for grid what exactly you see. You can do it upside down, backwards, or sideways. If you copied exactly what you see, you are going to get an amazing painting that looks photorealistic. Just paint what you see. But I mean, I like to put my own strokes in it and your own, put your own calligraphy, your own handwriting in it, your own style in it. So do something that's unique to you. So yes, copy what you see, but also put you into it because you are the artist and you make the decisions and you say well maybe I don't want to paint that little square green maybe let's make it purple and see what happens and I mean you can make something amazing just by changing up colors as long as you keep the same values correct and you change the colors you can get a super crazy looking painting that's pop art or something isn't that isn't that what Andy Warhol did so anyways think about it experiment have fun
So you can see that the bird is really starting to take shape here because I've added those darks. And now I'm gonna go back in, I'm gonna make all my little calligraphy handiwork of all the little shapes of the feathers. And um, we're just gonna go with the way it flows and just make adjustments here and there. And don't be afraid, just make those marks. So now I'm going to start defining the little shapes of the feathers on the wing where it's like gray. So what you're going to do is draw kind of a line in um, a darker color, the same color of the wing, and then you're going to add a little bit of water to it and smooth it out. So here I go. Here's my line. And here's another one and another one. Let's just define each of those little wings. I'm going to add a little water to one side of it, and that's going to give me the impression of the shadow um, and each individual feather on the wing. adding that yin yang to the to our illustration I'm drawing it as I go because I'm very impatient and I want to keep going so um, once you've worked an area and it's wet you don't want to come back with your watercolor and touch it with another color or because it's going to bleed in and so I like to have my heat gun with me and just um, 
you know, dry the area so I can get back in it right away. And it really speeds things along. But I have to say sometimes in watercolor, you want to let it dry, air dry, because you might achieve a better effect if you let it air dry. Um, because as long as your paper is wet, all the paint's going to keep moving. It's just going to keep moving until the paper is completely dry. It might be very subtle, but you might see some really beautiful things happen if you just let it air dry completely instead of using your heat gun. But for me, um, I know what it's going to do and I know what I want to achieve. So I'm going to use the heat gun here just to um, move things along lunar blue there and instead of black I use that lunar blue and it's a very beautiful color um, by Daniel Smith and I love Payne's gray also it's like a bluish gray and it makes some beautiful color for the feathers and and the wings um, I do feel that black in general is doesn't really work in painting so if you can create a black out of using different colors and um, like a blue or a purple, and you can just mix them together to create a beautiful, um, rich black instead of like a black that looks kind of dead and flat. And um, having blacks of different values and different color shades um, just adds some more, just real beauty to your painting.
So for my browns here that I added to my painting, I didn't really use the burnt umber. I kind of added green to the red or red to the green. If you, if you do a little test and you take your red and take your green and start moving them together, you're gonna get that neutral color. And um, you can, the more you add one way or the other way, depends on what you're gonna get for an outcome. So I'm pretty sure I just added more red to my green to get the brown. I probably added a teeny bit of that Payne's gray to it as well. And um, you can add it to even a teeny bit of the yellow to it. So you can create beautiful colors just out of the three, you know, colors of red, yellow, and blue. And um, I like to add that Payne's gray in there. So you don't really need a lot of colors when you're watercoloring, especially to start, because you can mix most of them yourself. Okay, so um, I am almost finished with this painting. I think it looks really beautiful. We added shading, we added different kinds of color values. We're mixing our paints and um, I'm just tidying it up here. And in the end, I'm just gonna get some white paint. It's either white gouache or a white ink. And I'm gonna use my number two. I'm just gonna go around and add these little tiny marks around the feathers just to, um, you know, define a few shapes back in. So I thank you so much for watching my YouTube channel. I appreciate you being here. God bless you and I will see you in the next video.